Season 1, Episode 1, Uno. Considered by many to be one of the greatest prequel series ever created, Better Call Saul follows the origin story of Saul Goodman, a shady criminal lawyer, showing how he came to be and where he ended up after the events of Breaking Bad. Your first thoughts are probably, hey, you just said he was a lawyer. Why the fuck is he making cinnamon rolls? Well, as it turns out, his prediction in the episode Granite State actually had quite a bit of merit. From here on out, I'm Mr. Low Profile, just another douchebag with a job and three pairs of Dockers. If I'm lucky, a month from now, best case scenario, I'm managing a Cinnabon in Omaha. Saul, going under the name Gene Takovic, now spends his days making mediocre cinnamon rolls and living under constant paranoia that he's going to be outed for his criminal history. He goes home and watches his old Better Call Saul commercials, reminiscing on his glory days and silently hoping that those days would return. He watches on the brink of tears, with the commercial reflecting in his glasses in full color. This may come as a surprise, but his life sucks. But let's not worry about the present. Let's go back to the way cooler past in full color. It's like the Wizard of Oz, but in reverse and also depressing. As this lady sucks down this ridiculously large big gulp, Saul pisses his pants and bursts into the courtroom, defending three teenagers for a crime they committed. What crime, you may ask? Nothing major. Just cutting off the head of a dead body and having sex with it. <laughs> I dare you to stick your wang in the throat hole. I will if you will, loser. Oh. Would this count as giving head or receiving head? As Saul receives a small check for his public defense work, he walks to his god-awful Suzuki esteem and heads out, and is forced to pay extra money for parking stickers by the toll booth operator, who's revealed to be Mike. Backing up! I have to back up! I need more stickers! Don't have enough stickers! Thank you! Employee of the month over here! Yeah! Saul meets with his new clients, Betsy Kettleman and her cuck husband, Craig, who stole well over a million dollars from the state treasury. They initially rethink having a lawyer, since they don't want to look guilty. Saul attempts to convince the two that having a lawyer is extremely important, but since they're both fucking stupid, they walk out. Don't you think, Mr. McGill? We should sleep on it. Oh, oh please, call me Jimmy. <laughs> oh, silly me, I forgot to mention. At this point in the show, Saul goes by the name Jimmy McGill, so I'm gonna call him Jimmy for now. As Jimmy orders a card to try to goad Betsy and Craig into using his- <laughs> And I just shit my pants. The two skateboard twins claim that Jimmy broke one of their legs, and that he now has to pay them up or else they'll call the cops. However, Jimmy quickly realizes that these two are pulling a scam, and calls the both of them out. Now, let's talk about what you owe me for the windshield. You- what? I'll take a check! Jimmy drives to a nail salon, and walks to his worn down office, and receives a check from a company named Hamlin Hamlin and McGill, HHM for short, which he tears apart. He enters the building, and criticizes Howard Hamlin, a main member of the firm, for sending such a small amount of money. This check was sent to help support Jimmy's brother, Chuck, since he is unable to work at the firm. And while Jimmy claims that Chuck is owed a substantial amount of money, Howard tells him off, claiming that the firm still holds Chuck in high regard. Jimmy says, shut up, you're nitpicking and biased, I won the argument, and storms out of the room. As he walks out of the building though, Jimmy notices that the Kettlemans have decided to use HHM as their legal counsel, and he beats the Kentucky Fried fuck out of a nearby trash can out of anger. He vents his anger to Kim, another member of HHM, and shares a cigarette with her. Later, Jimmy goes to Chuck's house, and it's revealed that Chuck is EMS, a disease that causes his body pain when coming into contact with electricity. Jimmy has devoted a large portion of his time and money into keeping Chuck's well-being secure, and Chuck reimburses his efforts by giving him like $2. Jimmy tells Chuck that it's about time he cashed out of HHM, since his condition is not likely to get any better. But Chuck refuses, fearing that the firm will be liquidated. To add more on top of Jimmy's already hefty amount of woes, Chuck recommends changing the name of his law practice. Howard brought this. You have to admit it could be confusing. Hamlin, Hamlin, McGill, James M. McGill. Wait, so wait, oh, so I'm not supposed to use my name? Wouldn't you rather build your own identity? Why ride on someone else's coattails? Jimmy would never change his name, though, so let's ignore that part. You want to dance, Howard? <laughs> let's dance. Jimmy tracks down the skateboard twins from earlier, and tells them the tale of his youth in Cicero, Illinois, where he was given the nickname Slippin' Jimmy, after collecting a ton of money from running slip and fall schemes during the winter. Jimmy offers the twins a con job, giving them two grand if they can hit the car of Betsy and Craig Kettleman. This is so that Jimmy can make another pitch to the Kettlemans to switch over from HHM to his practice. As the car drives over, the twins get into position, and they successfully crash into the windshield. However, rather than stopping to help the boys out, the car drives away instead. What? What the funny to run into you, Betsy? I was just uh And the winner for best editing goes to Better Call Saul! Yeah.
I hope you like this Emmy because we're never giving you another one ever again for anything ever. The twins follow the car, and they confront the driver, who turns out to be not at all the Kettleman's, but rather an elderly Mexican woman who doesn't speak English. As the two follow the lady into the house, Jimmy tracks down the car and knocks on the door. Open up, officer of the court! Good afternoon, this... Oh, fuck. I cannot believe I thought this first episode was just okay the first time I watched it. This episode was shockingly really good, and I had a lot more to say about it than I realized. The episode perfectly sets up the tone for the entire show going forward, as well as the slower pace that it's going for, with that scene near the beginning with the court just waiting around for Jimmy for like a solid minute. I love the little bits of foreshadowing here and there, from Chuck telling Jimmy to change his name, and Jimmy telling the court, If I were held accountable for some of the stupid decisions I made when I was 19, oh boy, wow. The cinematography is also a big step up from Breaking Bad, and trust me, this will not be the only time I bring this aspect of the show up. Overall, this episode is getting a high A tier, a very strong start for the show. Season 1, Episode 2, Miho. The episode begins with Tuco cooking up some Krabby Patties, when his grandma walks through the door, asking him to deal with the skateboard twins. While it initially seems like it's going to be a calm confrontation, one of the twins makes the horrible mistake of calling Tuco's grandma a biznatch, angering Tuco. You <clears throat> called her biznatch? I, yeah, no, whatever, man. Please, hurry it up. I'm hurt. <laughs> uh, no! Biznatch. As Tuco cleans up the damage and calls for backup, he answers Jimmy at the door and forces him inside at gunpoint. Before Tuco cancels the show, Jimmy uses his quick wit to convince Tuco to keep him alive and to let the skateboard twins leave unharmed. Uh, no! I mean, like, not unharmed, but you know what I mean. Tuco brings Jimmy to the twins and allows him to cut the twins from their shackles. Unfortunately, Jimmy forgot the fact that the twins are complete fucking morons, as one of the twins tries to throw him under the bus. It was him. It was all his idea. No, no, no. Shut up. Say what? He, he wanted to scam you. He said we could clear two grand easy. Oh, no, 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 no. Jimmy is taken out to the desert along with the twins, and tries to tell Tuco that he was after the Kettleman's, and not his grandma. Tuco doesn't believe him, believing that he's part of law enforcement. At first, Jimmy indulges Tuco's belief, claiming that he's an FBI agent who set up a sting to take down Tuco. However, Nacho, a member of the cartel who contrasts Tuco's more chaotic approach to business, calmly asks Jimmy for the truth, and Jimmy quickly drops the act and begs him to let him and the twins go. Nacho convinces Tuco to let them go, since killing a lawyer would arouse a ton of suspicion. They disrespected my abuelita. They called her Bisnatch! And they just walk! Ah! While Jimmy is let free, the twins are left to be killed by Tuco, and Jimmy tries his best to prevent the two from becoming strawberry slushies. He once again uses his quick wit to convince Tuco not to kill the twins, instead attempting to come to a compromise. Break their legs. How many legs? Two, they got two legs. One leg. Look, they can't skateboard for six months, and they're scared of you forever. Yeah. To show everybody that you are the man, but that you're fair. One leg each. Jimmy is forced to listen to Tuco break the twins' legs, and he rushes them both to the ER. You are the worst lawyer! The worst lawyer ever! Hey, I just talked you down from a death sentence oh, to six months oh, probation. Six. I'm the best lawyer ever. <laughs> Later that day, Jimmy goes on a date, but the sound of a nearby man snapping crackers in half gives Jimmy PTSD from that brutal scene, so he decides to get wasted to forget what happened. Chuck wakes him up the next morning, wrapped up in a space blanket, looking like a deranged conspiracy theorist. Jimmy asks why Chuck has it on, and Chuck says that Jimmy left his cell phone in the house the other night. Chuck also asks Jimmy about a medical bill that fell out of his pocket. Obviously, this bill was meant for the twins' broken legs, but Chuck thinks that Jimmy is relapsing back into his old ways of slipping Jimmy. Take off the space blanket. I didn't do anything wrong. It has nothing to do with that. It was your phone. But you threw the phone outside hours ago. What's next? Are you going to tell me that your illness is brought on not by a physical disorder, but due to the stress of worrying about Jimmy's behavior? You silly goose. We get one of the first great montages of the show, with Jimmy going about his day-to-day -day life defending criminals, collecting paychecks, and ranting about stickers. Petty was a prior. 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 You can have the rest of these. 
Petty was a prior. Jimmy goes back to his office, and before he can start another drinking binge, he's greeted by one of his customers, who turns out to be Nacho. He tells Jimmy that he's going to rob the Kettlemans of the 1.5 million they stole, and that he'll give Jimmy 10% of his earnings. I like ripping off thieves because they can't go to the cops. They have no recourse. Why would, why would you come to me for that? You already tried ripping them off. I'm gonna finish what you started. Jimmy claims that he wasn't trying to rip off the Kettlemans, and that he only wanted their business. Nacho laughs at this, and tells Jimmy that if he rats to the police, he'll kill him. For when you figure out you're in the game. Another easy A tier. Season 1, Episode 3. Nacho. In our first flashback in the show, we see Chuck talk to Jimmy in prison. Shitty haircut and all. Jimmy's in prison due to his Chicago sunroof incident, which we'll certainly get to know a lot more about in a few episodes to come. Jimmy begs for Chuck's legal counsel, promising that he'll act like a better person in the future, and Chuck reluctantly decides to defend him. By the way, one thing I want to note about this show is that, unlike its predecessor, the visuals for the intro actually change from episode to episode. One of my personal favorites is this one, featuring a lady using the scales of justice as an ashtray, a very fitting metaphor for the entire series. Jimmy calls Kim in the middle of the night, talking to her about the Kettleman case, and accidentally warns her that the Kettlemans may be in danger. Jimmy decides to warn the Kettlemans himself, so he uses a payphone and makes an anonymous tip to the couple using a sex robot voice. Hello? Kettlemans, you're in danger! You're in danger! I'm, so I'm sorry, what? This is a warning! You're in danger! The you have a terrible connection. Kettlemans, you're in danger. They're coming for your money. Bye. Betsy and Craig look outside the window and spot a suspicious looking van outside their house. The next day, Kim notifies Jimmy of a home invasion of the Kettlemans and he rushes out of the courtroom. Here, I'm in a real rush. I didn't have time to get the validation. Fine, nine bucks. <laughs> Screw you, geezer! Jimmy arrives at the scene. And Kim explains that not only was the house ransacked, but the Kettlemans are now missing, including their children. Kim asks Jimmy to elaborate on his Kettlemans are in danger comment. And while Jimmy explains that it's logical that someone would want to come after their money, Kim tells him to fuck off. Suspecting that he was the one who robbed the house, Jimmy calls Nacho. Or rather, he leaves like 40 messages for him, desperately trying to contact him like a clingy ex-girlfriend. Jimmy eventually gets a call back, but nobody answers, and the caller hangs up. Jimmy sulks back to his car, and he notices two men walking the same direction towards his car. Thinking Nacho was somehow able to track him down or something, Jimmy nonchalantly walks out of his car, and then proceeds to nonchalantly run down the alleyways the two men nonchalantly chase behind him. A cop car nonchalantly pulls up in front of Jimmy, and it's revealed that the two men were a part of law enforcement, and they arrest him nonchalantly. As it turns out, the suspicious looking van from earlier got its license plates tracked, which belonged to Nacho. Jimmy tells Nacho to give up the location of the family for him, but Nacho claims that Jimmy had him set up, since he had nothing to do with her disappearance. The cops are out there right now, poking into my business. You get me out of here, today, or you're a dead man. Kim allows Jimmy to take a look through the Kettleman's household, and as Jimmy looks through the children's bedrooms, he notices that a doll is missing from the daughter's playset. Jimmy figures that the Kettleman staged the kidnapping in order to run away with the money they stole, and goes outside to confess to Kim that he had made a warning call to the Kettleman's. I called the Kettleman's anonymously, to warn Anonymously, you did Oh god, you didn't... You didn't do the sex robot voice, did I you? I did. The tube and the whole thing. See, you thought I was kidding or something earlier. No, this is an actual plot point. Jimmy tries to get Kim on his side to help him find the Kettlemans and prove Nacho's innocence. But Kim says no way, Jose. Later, Jimmy tries to get back in the courtroom. But Mike still remembers the stunt Jimmy pulled the other day. And he doesn't let him through. Jimmy tries his best to protest against Mike. But with no luck. I'm gonna park right here! I don't think you wanna be doing that. Oh yeah? What are you gonna do? You got a poop-filled diaper in there? You gonna throw it at me? You gonna gum me to death, huh, geezer? Jimmy gets in trouble for assault, even though it was really him getting assaulted. And Mike is willing to drop his charges if Jimmy gets Nacho to tell where the Kettlemans are hiding. However, just as Jimmy is about to get booked, Mike changes his mind at the last minute and decides not to press any charges. We talked about this. You want to press charges? No. No, I don't. What are you doing, buddy? I thought you had our backs. No, I don't think I said that, buddy. As it turns out, Mike actually believes Jimmy's story, which is why he changed his mind. Mike believes that the Kettlemans didn't run very far from home, as he recalls a case from his days as a cop in Philly detailing a similar incident. With this advice in mind, Jimmy takes matters into his own hands and starts investigating the nearby area in search of the family. Eventually, he locates the family singing in a tent. 
Nice foreshadowing, by the way. Hey, it's me. Listen to this. You hear that? I found your dumbass clients. With the Kettleman's in the palm of his hand, Jimmy calmly confronts them. Here's Johnny! Ah! Kettleman's, no. time to ship out. No! Yes, you are! No! This is happening! No! This yes, is happening! Yeah. Another A tier. Season 1, Episode 4. Hero. We get another flashback to the Slip and Jimmy era, with Jimmy talking to some random dude while exiting their local furry convention. Oh, yeah! After completely whiffing a high five, Jimmy takes this guy to the end of an alleyway, where they encounter a completely blacked out dude with a fixation for buttholes. Help yourself to some of this, you butthole. Hey! Hey, we're not buttholes, but, alright? So stop but saying that. Oh, yeah. but, but. Butthole. The dude steals the $1,000 from the guy's wallet, while Jimmy steals his watch. The other dude notices that the watch is a Rolex, and demands that they split the money evenly, since he figures that the watch is worth three grand. The dude keeps the watch, while Jimmy keeps the money from the wallet, along with an extra $500 from the dude to make it even. As it turns out, however, it was all just another slip in Jimmy scheme, as the butthole guy rises from the ground, and the two smoke it up, their collection of cheap dollar store watches intact. We're taken back to the woods, where Jimmy tries to drag the Kettlemans back home. Betsy claims that they can't, since the court will absolutely peg Craig's ass in their case, and they try to bribe Jimmy with their money to not tell anyone about said money. To dissuade their offer, Jimmy makes one last attempt for them to switch over from HHM and use his legal services. But why not? I'm sorry. You're just... Just... what? You're the kind of lawyer... Guilty people hire. The next day, Jimmy thanks Mike for his advice, and Nacho is taken out of police custody. However, even though Jimmy just got him out of life in prison, Nacho still thinks that Jimmy ratted him out to the Kettlemans, which he did. But Jimmy defends himself, claiming that some neighbors ID'd his car, which they didn't. You have no idea the tap dance I had to give those cops to get you out of here. You gave them probable cause out the wazoo. You should be thanking this good Samaritan, because whoever he is, he did you a favor. Jimmy slumps back in his office later that night, and it's revealed that he ended up taking the Kettleman's bribe, which he enters as a retainer so it looks like an actual payment. <laughs> Jimmy uses some of the money to give himself a new makeover, and we learn what he was doing that for once Howard takes Kim on a ride-along. Well, yeah. I mean, that's my suit, right? Am I crazy here? No, you're not crazy. Look at the logo. That's our logo. This was an actual billboard that was put up in Albuquerque for a while, and you can actually still call this number. The voicemails changed a couple times, but this is the message you would have gotten if you called when season one was airing. Hello. You've reached the law offices of James M. McGill Esquire, a lawyer you can trust. Kindly leave your information at the tone, and Mr. McGill will phone you promptly. I've got your phone number and I'm going to wring your fucking neck. Howard is pretty upset by Jimmy's blatant copy pasting, and Kim goes to the salon to give Jimmy a cease and desist letter, and warns him that the future will not look pretty if he keeps it up. Jimmy and Kim's relationship is expanded upon a bit in this episode, with Jimmy at one point during a brief argument suggesting to Kim that she quit HHM, and work in a place where she's actually appreciated. The next day, Jimmy is told by a judge to take down the billboard, which Jimmy obliges. There are only so many fonts out there. Does Mr. Hamlin outright own them all? No, but we've been using this particular font for 12 years now, and it, in concert with our tri-rectangle graphic and Hamlindigo Blue... Hamlindigo Blue? Ew! Jimmy tries calling a bunch of news outlets to cover the injustice of his story, but none of them bite. So he hires a film crew and creates his own story. Let me tell you something. If they want to fight, they're going to get a fight. Because I'm not giving up. Not Holy shit! Dude! The dude! Dude! The dude! Jimmy rushes to the top of the billboard. The camera's still rolling, as a crowd begins to form around. He gets to the top and pulls the dude back up to the billboard. Because of his heroic efforts, Jimmy is interviewed by the local news, further pissing off Howard. This whole thing was a publicity stunt. It's gotta be. You don't think anyone's gonna actually buy this. Hard to say. People love a hero. The universe put me in there. I'd get whole thing's a damn stunt. For it, but I think my clients know that when they're in trouble, I'm there. 
I was just a guy. Jimmy's plan works out in his favor, as he gets several voicemails requesting for his services, and lands himself a spot on Chuck's daily newspaper. However, Jimmy doesn't want Chuck finding out that he ran another con, so he gives him a different paper, and claims that his sudden rise in business was because of Chuck's advice. Chuck congratulates Jimmy, but notices that his usual newspaper is nowhere to be seen. Desperate for his daily fix of the Albuquerque Journal, Chuck rushes out the door in his space blanket, the symptoms of his EMS taking over like crazy. <laughs> Chuck reads the paper and finds out about Jimmy's heroic act, worsening his already increasing symptoms. As amazing as that scene is, I'm still feeling a high beats here for this episode. Season 1, Episode 5, Alpine Shepherd Boy. Alright, I want you to look at the title of every Season 1 episode. Do any of them stick out? If you said, hey, the fifth episode doesn't fit the ends and O gimmick, you'd be correct. Apparently, the name of this episode was supposed to be Jell-O, referring to some advertisements Jimmy creates in the episode, but due to legal issues with the Jell-O company, they couldn't. So right off the bat, this episode's getting an F tier, but let's see if it can redeem itself. We're taken back to the moment after Chuck stole his neighbor's newspaper, and the police show up to his house to investigate the incident. The police ask to come into Chuck's home, but Chuck says no, due to his condition. As Chuck lectures the cops over probable cause, they look around the house and notice a bunch of ripped cords and lighter fluid, and assume that Chuck is a certified gas station tweaker. The police barge into the house, and the blinding sunlight, combined with his newfound stress over Jimmy's latest con, causes shit to hit the fan very quickly. Look, look, I'll give the paper back! While Chuck is recovering from his Call of Duty flashbang, Jimmy is out to talk to some potential clients as a result of last episode's con. But sadly for Jimmy, most of them turn out to be total nutjobs. The first guy is a crazy sovereign citizen cowboy dude, who wants to secede his land from the United States and create his own country. The cowboy offers Jimmy one million to work his case, but Jimmy quickly realizes that the cowboy is using his own form of currency. So that's strike one. He gives one of the best yee-haws I've ever heard in my life though, so bonus points for him. Yee! The second potential client is a much more normal-seeming guy, who's asking Jimmy for his help on creating a patent for a potty-training toilet that speaks whenever your toddler takes a shit. Fill me up, Chandler. Put it in me. Chandler's my youngest. Loves it. Huh. Give it to me, Chandler. I want it all. Mmm. Ah. Never mind, this guy's not normal. The third guy or gal rather, uses Jimmy's services for estate planning. And by estate planning, I mean redistributing a bunch of Hummel figurines to her family. Her name is Mrs. Strauss, and she's the most sane out of the trio of potential clients. And Jimmy manages to strike up a deal with her. Jimmy talks to Kim about his day while painting her nails, and Kim suggests to him that he should start focusing on Elder Law, since that lady from earlier wanted to fuck him. Aren't you a spicy one? Well. If I were 40 years younger, I'd have you buy me a piña colada. But there's no time for elder fucking, though, because Kim gets a call from Howard telling her that Chuck is in the hospital. <laughs> The editing and sound design for these Chuck electricity freakouts are awesome. It really makes you feel like you're being attacked by a million volts of electricity. Jimmy tries turning off all the lights in the room to prevent Chuck's symptoms from flaring up, and tries explaining his condition to the doctor. However, the doctor reveals to Jimmy and Kim that Chuck's illness is all completely in his head, as she turns on the electricity on Chuck's bed without him noticing, and none of his listed symptoms begin to flare up. The doctor suggests to Jimmy that he should commit Chuck to a mental institution, but Jimmy decides to send Chuck home instead. Jimmy arrives at the house with Chuck, and notices the newspaper on the ground with Jimmy's face on the cover. He realizes that Chuck got sick because of the paper, and he once again professes to Chuck that he isn't relapsing back into his slip in Jimmy days. He tells Chuck that he'll be focusing more on Elder Law for the time being, and Chuck's symptoms magically seem to decrease upon hearing this news. You're slipping Jimmy! No, I'm not. Okay, all cured now. Jimmy begins his transition into focusing on Elden Ring. I mean, Elder Law. By copying the clothing and mannerisms of famous TV lawyers, and placing ads at the bottom of Jell-O cups. Imagine eating Jell-O and being reminded that you're going to fucking die. We get this beautiful transition to the next day, and Mike has a stare down with some woman before driving back to his house, chugging down a Pabst Blue Ribbon. Heineken! Fuck that shit! 
Paps Blue Ribbon! He notices a shadow creep past his window, and he answers a knock at the door, who turn out to be the police. A long way from home, aren't you? You and me both. Kind of shocked how overhated this episode is. I'm feeling a high beats here for this one. Season 1, Episode 6, 5 0. We're taken to a flashback of Mike moving from Philadelphia to Albuquerque, as he meets the same woman from earlier at the train station, who's revealed to be his daughter in law, Stacy Ermintrout. As she walks away, Mike heads into a nearby restroom. Mike is on his period right now, so he takes some tampons from the ladies' room and uses them to clean himself up, along with treating a wound on his left shoulder. He breathes heavily, as if he just overcame a traumatic event. Mike leaves the station and heads over to Stacy's house, where Mike plays with his granddaughter, Kaylee. Stacy talks to Mike about Maddie, her former husband who had recently passed away, and talks about how he acted moody and unreasonable in the weeks preceding his death. She mentions a phone call that Maddie took in which he acted belligerent and irrational, and how she believes that phone call was directed to Mike. He denies having any heart-to-heart -heart conversations around that time, and tells Stacy to accept the fact that Maddie is gone. I know what you're doing, replaying it over and over, thinking if I'd noticed this or changed that, maybe I could have done something. You don't think I haven't had those thoughts? I do. <sighs> Every day. You gotta quit beating yourself up like this. Mike leaves the house, and takes a taxi to the veterinarian's office to stitch up his wound. Oh, what's that? You thought I meant to say doctor's office? Nope, you heard me right. This office belongs to Dr. Caldera, a veterinarian who has many secret ties to Albuquerque's criminal underworld. Caldera offers Mike some criminal work, but Mike turns him down as we're taken into the smooth-ass transition into the present day, where Mike is being interrogated by the police from last episode. You really want the formal treatment? Lawyer. It's just a couple of questions. Hey, uh, ain't nothing but a thing. Lawyer. You're not under arrest. Lawyer. Okay, did anybody hear say arrest? No. Lawyer. Lawyer. Mike coerces a plan with Jimmy for him to, accidentally, spill some coffee on one of the detectives. Jimmy denies going through with his plan, and the detectives begin to grill Mike. The detectives state that Mike worked as a Philadelphia cop for over 30 years, alongside his son, Matt, a rookie officer. Matt answered a call along with two other officers, Hoffman and Fensky, and was killed during a shootout at a crack house. The case ended up going cold, and no leads could be found until three months ago, when Hoffman and Fensky both turned up dead. The detectives figured that the two got caught up in some shady business, and they asked Mike what business Hoffman and Fensky were involved in. Mike claims that he doesn't know anything about the two, and the last time he saw them was at a bar the night they were killed. The detectives ask if Mike remembers anything from that night at the bar, but Mike still claims that he remembers nothing, and the interrogation is cut short by Mike. Oh, hey. Oh, shit. Oh, Jeez, sorry, sorry. I got it, I got it, thank sorry. you. Jimmy ends up going along with Mike's plan, and Mike manages to snatch the notebook from the detective. Let's get an instant replay on that scene. Oh, Jeez, sorry, sorry. I got it, I got it, thank sorry. you. Oh, amazing. The attention to detail in the show is incredible. I love how they didn't do the cliche, cut back to previous shot with alternate angles thing that they do in movies. Not only do they let the audience fill in the gaps themselves, but they also make rewatching the episode all the more interesting. Mike reads through the detective's notebook, and realizes that Stacy was the one who called the cops in the first place. Mike storms over to her house, angrily asking why she called them. She explains that she found money Matt hid in a suitcase, and reported the cash to the police in an effort to catch Matt's killer. Mike asks why she didn't come to him first, to which Stacy says that she believed it would have destroyed him to think Matt was a dirty cop. Stacy believes that it doesn't matter whether or not Matt was dirty, but Mike vehemently argues back this point. He wasn't dirty! God damn you! You get that through your head! My son wasn't dirty! After some intense cinematography, we're taken back to Mike's visit at the bar where he opens up the door of a cop car with some string to steal something. He drinks heavily at the bar that night, and he looks at Hoffman and Fensky at a nearby table, suspecting that they were the ones who really killed Matt. He walks over to their table, and whispers ominously in their ears. Later that night, Mike leaves the bar, proclaiming that he'll be moving to Albuquerque. As he stumbles down the street, Hoffman and Fensky offer him a ride in their car, practically forcing him to get in. They take away his gun as they strap him in, 
And they ask what Mike meant when he said he knew it was them. You killed him. You killed Manny. And you killed him for nothing. You killed him because you were scared of what you thought he might do. The cops pull over to a nearby alley, and Mike grabs a pistol dug between the seats as they force him out of the car. They plan to murder Mike, and to frame it as a suicide. He's drinking himself to death. We're doing him a favor. Smart. That's what I would have done if oh. I were you. We're taken back to the present day, where Mike returns to Stacy's house to explain what had truly happened. Mike explains that stealing, bribery, and other forms of corruption were common back at Philadelphia's precinct, and admits that he was heavily involved. Fenske had stolen a hefty amount of cash from a drug bust, and Hoffman offered Matty a cut of the cash. Matt, shocked by this offer, called Mike to ask him what to do, and Mike told him to accept the money, since reporting Hoffman and Fenske would have likely gotten him killed. I told him I did it too. And that's what you heard that night. Me talking him down, him kicking and screaming until the fight went out of him. He put me up on a pedestal. And I had to show him that I was down in the gutter with the rest of them. Broke my boy. I broke my boy. Matt listened to Mike and took the money. However... Matt hesitated while taking the money, which convinced Hoffman and Fenske that he wasn't solid, resulting in his murder. Hoffman and Fenske... If they killed Maddie, who killed them? What happened? You know what happened. The question is... Can you live with it? In a show full of some of the most talented actors and inspired performances of all time, I personally think Jonathan Banks is up there in at least the top three just for this episode alone. The character of Mike Ermintrout has grown on me ever since I started re-watching this series. Despite being a stoic, grumpy old man, Jonathan Banks' performance is incredibly captivating to watch. You could put him in a metal folding chair, have him sit in front of a wall with drying paint and film that for two hours, and I'd still be invested in his character. His monologue near the end is one of the few times I've ever been on the verge of tears watching a TV show or movie. There's something so heartbreaking about watching this tough, grisly retired cop from Philadelphia let his emotions overwhelm him. It's an incredibly tragic backstory, making Mike even more interesting to watch than he already is. An easy S tier, and absolutely deserving of being the first one on our list. Season 1, Episode 7, Bingo. Mike and Jimmy are confronted by the two detectives, who take the notebook back from Mike, and one of the detectives threatens them with jail time, believing that they purposefully spilled coffee on him to steal the notebook. Jimmy claims that they found it at the parking lot, which angers the detective, and he starts berating Mike, telling him that he hopes his somewhat illegal behavior didn't rub off on the rest of his family. The detective storms out of the room, and Mike tells Jimmy to fuck off, as he starts talking to the other detective, who apologizes for Mr. Angry Man's behavior. They talk about the old precinct, and how a majority of the team believe that Hoffman and Fenske got what came to them. Jimmy asks Mike what he said to the detective, and Mike tells him to suck his dick and drives off. Jimmy goes to Chuck's house to deliver him food, and he discovers him standing outside, counting to 120 before rushing back into the house. Chuck is trying to train himself to build a tolerance to electricity, and Chuck claims that he's doing this because he wants to better himself and get back into work. Jimmy brings in a bunch of case files he claims are 413s. You mean 513s? 513s from his transition into Elder Law. Jimmy brings Kim into his new office space, which has a ton of space in multiple rooms compared to his old office in the nail salon. Jimmy shows her the corner office, and Jimmy says it's reserved for a partner. More specifically, Kim. However, Kim tells Jimmy that she's too invested in HHM to partner with Jimmy, and that she feels as if she owes a lot of her life to HHM, since they put her through law school. Jimmy is definitely feeling really good about this statement and not at all heartbroken and disappointed. I mean, just look at him. He's so happy for Kim that his eyes are welling up. Kim breaks it to the Kettlemans that they probably aren't going to be getting a favorable verdict, but that she's worked up an arrangement with a DA to lessen Craig's sentence from 30 years to 16 months, at the cost of admitting their guilt and giving back the stolen money. 
Since these two are some of the smartest characters in the entire show, they make the right call and go with Kim's deal. You're fired. Okay. The two storm out of the office to Betsy's boyfriend's house, and Jimmy starts hosting bingo games for the elderly people he's doing work for, and we're introduced to Irene, who secures the bag with a bingo. She talks about her stupid fucking cats, and Jimmy stops his bingoing to take a call from the Kettlemans, who have asked to reuse him as their legal counsel. They tell Jimmy that they've parted ways with HHM, and Craig's attempt to get a coffee is rejected by his dominatrix wife. Jimmy brings up the, you're the type of lawyer guilty people hire quote, but the two brush it off, saying that they realize Jimmy's passion. Jimmy tells them that he can't, since he now focuses on elder law, but they remind him about the retainer they bribed him with just a few episodes ago. Jimmy calls Kim, ranting to her about the stupid Kettlemans, and she tells him to try to convince the couple to return to HHM. Jimmy tries his best to do this, but that $30,000 retainer's looming over him like the ghost of Christmas past, and he realizes that his hands are tied. Jimmy goes to the HHM office, with Howard giving him a small amount of paperwork in the Kettleman case, and Jimmy finds out that Kim was demoted due to her losing the Kettlemans. Jimmy and Kim have a smoke together, mirroring the shot from Uno, and Jimmy apologizes for taking the Kettleman's case. Kim talks about how guilty and stupid the Kettlemans are, and that the only current chance they have at winning their case is by using their money to make a plea deal. As Jimmy struggles with the case, he thinks about Kim's money comment and comes up with an idea. He hires Mike to run a con job on the Kennelmans. He first sprays Jimmy's leftover retainer money with fluorescent liquid and places it on a toy truck. He eats a ton of apples as he waits for the Kettlemans to notice the money lying about, and Cuckold shows the money to Dommy Mommy Betsy, who blames the misplacement on the kids. As the family goes to sleep, Mike sneaks into the house with a blacklight and tracks down the sprayed stash of cash with a fluorescent glow. Mike takes the money down to Jimmy's office, and Jimmy puts the rest of his retainer money along with the stolen cash. What are you doing? The right thing. The next day, Jimmy heads to the Kettleman's, telling them about the deal they'll be taking. But before we get to the nitty gritty, I think we should chat about your deal. Uh, we told you there will be no deal. Might I suggest that you go check on that money you insist you didn't take? <laughs> In the upstairs bathroom, under the sink? Wait, how could you? Betsy! No, 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 no. <laughs> What did you do with it? By it, you mean... Where is it? Oh, you mean the money. Jimmy tells the two that the money is headed to the DA's office, and Betsy threatens to have Jimmy arrested. You stole from us. We'll... We will have you arrested. I, I can see how upset you are, but think about what you just said. Criminals have no recourse, and you two... You're criminals, big time. This line is a great callback to what Nacho told Jimmy back in the episode, Miho. Ironic how the guy who tried to convince Nacho not to steal from the couple ended up becoming the thief himself. Jimmy quits representing the couple on the spot and tells the two to apologize to Kim, take her back as their lawyer, and take the deal. Betsy threatens to tell them about Jimmy's bribe, but Jimmy points out that this would implicate Betsy in the crime along with Craig. Betsy complains about their predicament, but Craig stands up to her, or rather, sits down to her and convinces her that this deal is for the best. Jimmy brings the two to HHM with Kim, and Kim silently mouths thank you to Jimmy. Jimmy slumps back into his new office, and walks into the corner office, viewing it as if it's a huge blemish in an otherwise perfect situation. His plans to work with Kim have been completely dissolved, and he kicks the door in rage before collapsing on the ground. Law offices of James M. McGill, how may I direct your call? This was a good episode, featuring some emotional and impactful scenes along with a pretty important character moment for Jimmy. This one's getting a beat here. Season 1, Episode 8. Rico. We're taken to another blueberry-colored flashback, featuring Jimmy going about his job as a male guy at the HHM office. He goes to Kim's office and hands her a letter, which reveals that Jimmy passed the state bar. The two celebrate, and Jimmy goes to Chuck's office to give him the good news. Chuck is shocked, since Jimmy had not told him that he was working to obtain a law degree, and Jimmy tells him that he took an online course for the University of American Samoa, another nod to Breaking Bad. While Chuck feigns excitement over this sudden development, he's secretly really, really not happy. Oh, hey, I was hoping, once I get sworn in and everything, consider hiring me. As what? Oh, a, a lawyer. Obviously, yeah. It's almost like Chuck is already trying to forget the fact that his brother can now work as a lawyer. The rest of the HHM staff celebrate Jimmy's success, and Howard enters the room, kicking everybody out so he can have a talk with Jimmy. Kim shuts the door, making the conversation between Howard and Jimmy inaudible, with only the monotonous sounds of a copier that can be heard. 
Through the two's body language along with the movement of the camera, it's implied that Jimmy's job at HHM has been rejected by the higher-ups. Howard exits the room, and the camera zooms out, as we see Jimmy sulking in his chair, disappointed. The cinematography perfectly captures Jimmy's feelings of isolation and disappointment, giving off similar vibes to the ending of Crawl Space. Back in the present, Howard and Kim are interviewed by news anchors, sharing the news of their successful plea agreement with a DA for the Kettleman case. Jimmy watches the report unhappily before meeting with Irene, authorizing her last will and testament. Jimmy fronts her the bill, but Irene is seemingly low on cash, only being able to pay 43 of the $140. Irene says that she'll be able to pay the bill once she receives her weekly allowance, which catches Jimmy off guard as he walks out of her apartment. Irene reveals that she's given $500 a month, and that all of her money goes through Sandpiper, including her pension and social security. She says that Sandpiper takes out what they need before giving the money back to her. Jimmy checks with her friends to make sure that Sandpiper isn't just doing this to Irene. And sure enough, his suspicions are confirmed. For those of you who thought that segment was too complicated, Sandpiper overcharged big monies on old people, not legally. Jimmy rushes to the house, and it's revealed from the previous episode that Chuck filed all of Jimmy's Sandpiper wills and criticizes him for doing a ton of work and wanting to be a big shot. While Chuck tells Jimmy to hire a paralegal, Jimmy tells him to shut the Chuck up and check out this crazy Sandpiper shit. Chuck takes a look, and notices all of the small things that Sandpiper is overcharging the residents for, which is printed in extremely small text. Jimmy points out that this could be a huge case for him, and Chuck advises Jimmy that he should investigate for more information. Jimmy heads to Sandpiper, but is denied access by this lunch lady looking secretary. Jimmy notices that one of the employees is shredding documents, and is blocked by the security guards while trying to walk in. Jimmy asks to use their bathroom before leaving, and uses this time to file a lawsuit on the back of a notebook and a roll of toilet paper, which is completely unrealistic. The toilet paper in every public place that I've been to are like that cheap half-ply discount toilet paper that you have to use an entire roll of to get even the least bit clean. And yet, somehow, Jimmy's pen doesn't go right through it. They gotta be using 16-ply in that bitch. This is a demand letter informing Sandpiper Crossing of pending litigation for defrauding my clients through systematic overcharging, so call your lawyers right now and tell them I said that. Me, James McGill Esquire. I'm telling you guys, big mistake! Ah. Later that night, Jimmy spies on Sandpiper and watches them secretly dump out all the shredded documents. He gags as he searches through the garbage dump and gets dumped with even more garbage by two other employees. As he looks around, Jimmy gets a call from Rich Schweikart, a lawyer who works for the firm representing Sandpiper, Schweikart and Coakley. Rich asks about the demand letter written on toilet paper, and Jimmy describes the fraud Sandpiper is committing, and the actions he'll take to bring the company to justice. Rich claims that Jimmy has no basis to threaten litigation, and hangs up the phone. Sorry for interrupting your evening. Enjoy the magic flute. Blow my magic flute. Jimmy climbs out of the garbage and realizes that the shredded documents were placed in the recycling bin. This company may scam the elderly and put them in massive debt, but at least they recycle. Jimmy later dumps the documents on the ground, spending the rest of the night trying his best to piece them all back together. Chuck asks Jimmy what the fuck he's doing, and Jimmy tells him what happened, convincing Chuck that this was a totally legal move. Chuck gets Jimmy a cup of coffee, but Jimmy falls asleep before he can get his caffeine hit, and Chuck decides to sort the papers together on his own. Impressively, Chuck manages to put a ton of papers back together, including one that Chuck claims to be the smoking gun to Jimmy's case. Chuck also offers his help with the case, which makes Jimmy ecstatic. Rich gets sent a fax revealing the unshredded documents, and he pulls up to Chuck's to arrange a meeting. Chuck is initially nervous, since it's the first time in a while he's done any legal work, but Jimmy motivates him to march onwards. Rich claims that Sandpiper is a perfectly moral place for their customers to live in, and they claim that the overcharging was due to an accounting error. They offer to give their clients a check to cover the miscalculated expenses, as well as another 46 grand to cover legal fees. Jimmy doesn't give in, however, as he pulls out the smoking gun paper, which reveals that interstate deals were made with the company on overcharged syringes, making Sandpiper viable for a RICO case. Rich asks their price, to which Chuck responds with $20 million. Since Chuck figures that Sandpiper has multiple locations that are also overcharging in multiple states, which could result in a class action lawsuit, Rich shits his pants and drives away. Mike goes to Dr. Caldera's and makes a request for work, while Jimmy brings in more clients. Jimmy forgets some papers in the car, so Chuck goes outside to retrieve them, completely forgetting the fact that he's sensitive to electricity. Jimmy rushes outside, and Chuck is reminded of his symptoms, which shocks him, figuratively and literally. For a brief moment, Chuck was able to work with Jimmy without being reminded of the stress of Jimmy's antics, to the point where he completely forgot about his supposed illness. If it wasn't clear enough already, Chuck's EMS being completely in his head has been outright confirmed.
A tier. Season 1, Episode 9, Pimento. Chuck and Jimmy sit on a park bench together, taking in Chuck's newfound tolerance to the electricity around him. We get a sneak peek at Bob Odenkirk's OnlyFans, and Chuck warns Jimmy that Sandpiper is likely to file a restraining order to keep Jimmy off the property, which Jimmy later successfully manages to deny from being approved. Mike accepts his very first job offer from Dr. Caldera, and as Jimmy cheers about his minor victory over Sandpiper, he realizes that Sandpiper has resorted to dumping a metric fuckton of documents to halt their progress. Jimmy thinks that this won't be a big deal, but Chuck says that the case is no longer a two-man job, and suggests referring the case to HHM, which pisses off Jimmy, since he feels like his one chance to regrow his bond with his brother has been eliminated once again. Chuck manages to persuade Jimmy into referring the case, and Jimmy reluctantly agrees, figuring that this case will get him a job at HHM. I guess I'll have to get an office right next to yours. Finally out of the mailroom, huh? Mike stands around in the parking lot next to Big Muscle Man and Trevor from GTA 5, waiting for his client to arrive. Trevor asks Mike what he's carrying, to which Mike responds that he's carrying a pimento sandwich. Trevor clarifies that he meant what weapons he's carrying, to which Mike responds that he's carrying a pimento sandwich. Mike's client, Price, pulls into the parking lot, and he turns out to be the biggest Reddit user in the entire show, competing with the likes of Gail Bedeker. Price awkwardly stumbles through his introduction, offering $500 per guy, but Trevor says he should just give him and the big guy $750 each, since Mike over here didn't pack a gun. Mike offers to take one of Trevor's guns, which pisses off Trevor, and he challenges him to take his gun off his person. To which Mike responds that he's carrying a pimento sandwich. What the son of a- <laughs> Mike takes his pimento sandwich and heads off with Price, and Jimmy and Chuck head to HHM to refer the case, with Jimmy sneaking in Chuck's conspiracy blanket to help ease the symptoms. Jimmy realizes that his phone is dead, and HHM shuts down the power of the entire building in preparation for Chuck's arrival. Howard thanks Jimmy for bringing the case in, but rather than giving him a job at HHM, Howard offers Jimmy 20% of the overall settlement, as well as a $20,000 of counsel fee. Jimmy's like, yeah, cool, thank you, but where's my fucking job? To which Howard explicitly states that the firm is not hiring Jimmy back. Jimmy and Chuck attempt to argue back, and Jimmy threatens to keep the case for himself, but Howard makes his stance clear. Jimmy calls Howard a pig fucker, and Howard wishes him luck moving forward. What the hell just happened? Kim asks Howard what the hell just happened, saying that Jimmy deserves a seat at HHM for offering the case to the company, but Howard tells Kim that it's none of her concern. Kim continues to ask Howard to elaborate, saying that he's making the wrong decision, but Howard tells her that she is welcome to keep it to herself. Because I don't care. Something comes over Howard as Kim leaves, and he tells her to stay and close the door. Price meets with his customer, Nacho, and exchanges the pills he stole from his employer. Price notices that they're short $20. Uh, we're, we're short 20 $20. That's fine. Agreed amount, or no deal. Nacho asks if Mike is willing to blow up the deal over $20, to which Mike rhetorically asks the same to Nacho. Nacho agrees, and hands Price over the missing 20 As Price gives Mike his money, he asks him how he knew that he didn't need to bring his gun. And Mike reveals that he did a lot of digging into Nacho, learning that he's making this deal outside of his usual crew, so it was in his best interest to not fuck anything up. Mike says to do your homework if you're going to be a criminal, but Price claims that he's not a bad guy, and Mike clarifies the difference between a criminal and a bad guy. I've known good criminals and bad cops, bad priests, honorable thieves. You can be on one side of the law or the other. You can go home today with your money and never do this again. But you took something that wasn't yours, and you sold it for a profit. You're now a criminal. Good one, bad one, that's up to you. Jimmy meets with Kim at the nail salon to drink his ass off and rant about Howard, but Kim advises Jimmy to take the deal, which pisses off Jimmy even more. He accuses Kim of making some sort of secret deal with Howard to be on his side, and that she threw him under the bus just so she didn't have to work in the mailroom. Kim silently tells Jimmy to take the deal one last time on the verge of tears, and leaves the salon. Jimmy slumps back into his office, and as he plugs his phone in, he realizes that someone else had to have used his phone the night before. The next morning, he goes to Chuck's place, telling him that he'll accept Howard's deal. He talks about how great it would have been if him and Chuck were able to work together on the case, and Chuck says he'll continue to badger Howard for a position for Jimmy. Maybe I can gradually wear him down, you know, get him to come around. <laughs> That's... thanks. Wow, you 
I'm so lucky to have you looking out for me. Jimmy suggests to Chuck that he should quit HHM in order to force Howard to give Jimmy a position due to the sheer amount of respect and power Chuck holds of the company. You've got the nuclear option. Launch the doomsday device. Game over if working with me is what you really want. Right, Chuck? You called him. You called Hamlin. Jimmy confronts Chuck, telling him about the fact that he always turns his phone off before placing it outside, and about the deleted phone call that was placed at 2 in the morning two nights beforehand, which was made to Howard. Jimmy figures how painful it must have been for Chuck to make that phone call, and believes that the only thing that Chuck was willing to do to endure that pain was to keep Jimmy out of HHM. It was always you, right? Right back to when I passed the bar and tried to join the firm, you didn't want me. Tell me why. Why were you working against me, Chuck? You're not a real lawyer. I'm what? You're not a real lawyer. The University of American Samoa, for Christ's sake, an online course? What a joke. I worked my ass off to get where I am. And you take these shortcuts and you think suddenly you're my peer? I committed my life to this. Chuck rants about how Jimmy doesn't have the same level of respect or dedication to his job as he does. Jimmy disappointingly says that he thought Chuck was proud of him, to which Chuck says that he was more satisfied when Jimmy straightened out and got a job in the mailroom. So that's it then, right? Keep old Jimmy down in the mailroom, because he's not good enough to be a lawyer. I know what you were, what you are. People don't change. You're slipping Jimmy. And slipping Jimmy I can handle just fine, but slipping Jimmy with a law degree is like a chimp with a machine gun. Chuck continues to rant about Jimmy refusing to take his job seriously. And Jimmy decides that this is the straw that broke the camel's back in regards to taking care of Chuck. I got you a 20 pound bag of ice and some bacon and some eggs and a couple of those steaks that you like. Enough for three or four days. After that, you're on your own. I am done. It's easily one of the most tragic moments in the entire show. Jimmy did so much to take care of his brother while balancing out his work life, and all he ever wanted was Chuck's love and validation. But Chuck doesn't see Jimmy as a changed man. All he sees is the former law-exploiting con artist that lives in the past. All he sees is something to worry about, to the point where he can't even use the electricity that surrounds him. All he sees is slipping Jimmy. In the last scene of the previous episode, it's as if Chuck was able to let go of the past for a brief moment, and finally be able to work alongside his brother. But his petty instincts still lingered to the point where he was able to risk giving up a multi-million dollar case just so he didn't have to work with Jimmy. Sure, Jimmy isn't exactly a law-abiding citizen, and he's still willing to pull a scheme every now and again. But over time, his schemes were made less for his own benefit and more to support the people around him. I believe that Jimmy was on a path to change, all of it just to be crumbled by Chuck's malicious intentions. With that in mind, I think I have no choice but to give this one an S tier, an absolute highlight for Season 1. Season 1, Episode 10 Marco. We open up with a flashback to Cicero, with Marco tricking two boys out of $20. Shitty haircut Jimmy enters the bar, telling Marco that he'll be moving to Albuquerque with Chuck for a job in the HHM mailroom. Marco tries to tempt Jimmy into staying for one last blowout, but Jimmy puts his foot down and says goodbye, frustrating Marco. Back in the present, Jimmy begrudgingly hands over the Sandpiper case to HHM, and apologizes to Howard for calling him a pig fucker. Howard hands over the check for 20 k and Jimmy hands over a long list of needs for Chuck, asking Howard to take care of him for the time being. Howard is impressed by Jimmy's commitment to Chuck, and promises to take care of his needs. This information makes the previous episode all the more frustrating. Imagine denying the person who took care of your needs for a year, and brought a multi-million dollar lawsuit to your company, a job, all because of some stupid mistakes he made 10 years ago. Chuck has got to be the pettiest man alive. It's like over the course of Season 1, we're led to believe that Howard was going to be the major obstacle for Jimmy. But as it turns out, he was actually just a decent guy, forced to bend to the will of one of the most revered and powerful members of the company. I'm telling you man, Chuck sucks! In another shot paralleling Uno, Jimmy and Kim bring up the papers to the Sandpiper case, and Jimmy apologizes to Kim for yelling at her the night before. Kim tells Jimmy that he can let out his emotions, but Jimmy decides not to, saying that there's nothing he can do about it, to which Kim compliments him on his maturity. He's my brother, he thinks I'm a scumbag, there's nothing I can do to change that. Wow, that's mature. Dalai Lama's got nothing on me. I mean, like... 
that's objectively true. Jimmy hosts some more bingo rounds at Sandpiper, but keeps landing on Bs, as he struggles to find any other words that start with B. Hey, it's our old friend B! B as in... The Trail. Benedict Arnold betrayed the United States. The constant string of bees begins to frustrate Jimmy, as he begins to let his anger and resentment over Chuck's betrayal fester into the bingo game. B as in... Brother. Brother. Jimmy pulls out yet another B, and with the context of Breaking Bad in mind, unintentionally slips the fact that he wants to drop dead. B as in Battleship. B as in Bourbon. B as in Belize. I would love to go there, but, uh, let's face it, that's never gonna happen. None of us is ever leaving this godforsaken wasteland. The people in the nursing home give Jimmy really weird looks as he pulls out yet another B, and as he looks at the number, he rants to the elderly folks about the time he pulled a Chicago sunroof back in Cicero on a guy who slept with his ex-wife and owed him money, which is what he got arrested for in the cold open back in Nacho. What is a Chicago sunroof, you're probably asking. Well, I'll let Jimmy explain this one. He drove up and he double parked outside of Dairy Queen and went in to get some soft serve. Now Chet drove a white pearlescent BMW 7 series with white leather interior. I climbed up top and I may have defecated uh, through the sunroof. I did not know that his children were in the back seat. Okay, maybe I spoke too soon. The emotional turmoil eventually becomes too much for Jimmy to handle, and he storms out of the room. This scene is yet another example of the brilliant writing of this show. It perfectly manages to balance both intense emotional drama and comedy, going from, oh no, the emotional scars left by Jimmy's brother after over a year of taking care of him are starting to bleed into his personal life, to, damn Jimmy, you shit with that ass? Jimmy takes a cab back to Cicero, and heads to the old bar where him and Marco would pull endless schemes on unsuspecting customers. He spots Marco inside, completely tapped out. What happened to Myrna? Myrna? She's doing all right. She's my stepmom. Tell her slipping Jimmy says hello. Marco and Jimmy greet each other after 10 years of being apart, catching up with each other's lives. Marco has trouble breathing for a moment while asking Jimmy about his mom, and Jimmy reveals that his mother passed away three years ago. As the two drink, Jimmy notices a Ted Beneke looking ass customer and pulls a scheme with Marco, making up an elaborate story about a fake JFK coin facing the West that's supposedly rare and worth a ton of money. This piques the interest of Ted Beneke number two, who ends up buying the coin off Jimmy, successfully pulling the con. We get this fantastic montage of Jimmy and Marco spending a ton of time together pulling cons and making money, as Jimmy recluses back more and more into his slippin' Jimmy persona. We also get the origin to Jimmy's Kevin Costner story. Hey, you are not Kevin Costner. I was last night. As the girls leave, Jimmy looks to his messages, remembering the responsibilities he left back in Albuquerque. Jimmy tells Marco that he's gotta go home, revealing that he now works as a lawyer. Before Jimmy leaves for good, Marco reveals that they have one last fake Rolex to rip somebody off with. While Jimmy is reluctant at first, Marco tells him that conning is the only thing he lives for, and begs him to do one last con for old time's sake, which Jimmy agrees to. They set up the con at the same alleyway from the fourth episode, as Marco silently hums to himself. Jimmy howls, the guy picks up the wallet, and they notice Marco passed out, all according to plan. As Jimmy pokes him with a stick, however, Marco doesn't respond, and Jimmy realizes that Marco had a heart attack. This was the greatest week of my life. Hey! Hey! Hey, wake up, man! Come on! Marco! Buddy! Marco passes away, while Jimmy desperately tries to resuscitate him. Jimmy attends his funeral the next day, where he's given Marco's ring from his mother as a gift. Kim updates Jimmy, telling him that the Sandpiper case is extended to include another firm, Davis and Maine, who are offering him a job at the company. Jimmy thanks Kim for going to the effort of recommending him, but Kim reveals that a lot of the persuasion came from Howard. Back in Albuquerque, Ernesto, one of the best interns ever, delivers Chuck his supplies, and as he walks out of the house, notices Jimmy sitting nearby in his car, which Chuck notices out the window, right before Jimmy leaves for his interview with Davis in Maine. As he's about to enter through the doors, he pauses for a moment, reflecting on his life choices. At this moment, he's at a crossroads. Does he want to continue being a lawyer and prove his brother wrong, or does he want to continue relapsing back into the schemes of his past life? 
He rubs Marco's ring on his finger, reminding him of his supposed glory days, and he turns around and leaves the station. He talks to Mike about their mission to take down the Kettlemans, and how they had well over a million dollars sitting in front of them. He asks why they didn't just split the money 50-50, to which Mike reminds him of Jimmy's line about doing the right thing. Jimmy drives away in his car, as he starts humming a certain song to himself. It really is insane just how good Season 1 is on rewatch. When I began this tier list series, I was especially excited to rewatch Better Call Saul more than anything, since I had a very strong hunch that this show was going to be even better to watch, with the conclusion of both shows in mind. And not only was it good, it was amazing. I can't even fathom how I thought this season was only pretty good on first viewing. The setup of the story is so expertly crafted thanks to the show's god-tier writing. All of the events of the season connect with each other seamlessly, and it all feels natural thanks to the slow burn of the show. There are a lot of slow moments in some episodes that I've really started to appreciate knowing the full context of the show. They all build up to this incredible and heart-wrenching climax that, had the show not taken its time, would not have been nearly as impactful as it is. It was definitely a ballsy move on the crew's part to create a story that they knew damn well would take several seasons for viewers to appreciate, but man do they deliver. That's not even getting into the technical achievements this season accomplishes with the lighting, cinematography, sets, costume design, and I don't even need to get into the acting of the show. You already know how good everybody involved does, even with the smaller roles like Rich or Marco. I'm probably blowing my load way too early with complimenting the show this much in the first season alone. But can you blame me? As much as I love Breaking Bad, I didn't find a ton of rewatch value in it, apart from a couple episodes. But with Better Call Saul, there's all these little details and lines that you notice, along with the subtle changes in the character's actions, making it so fun to pick apart and analyze. It's probably why the script for this video has reached the same length as my Breaking Bad Season 5 tier list, which, mind you, I still believe is one of the greatest seasons in television history. And let me tell you, we are only just getting started. I haven't even used this time to talk about the episode I just watched, so I should probably do that real quick before I end the video. A lot of people give this episode shit, saying that it was a bit underwhelming considering what just went down last episode. And yeah, while it isn't as good as Pimento, I think that this was still an all-around great conclusion to the season. I actually enjoyed Marco's character quite a bit, even though he dies after like one episode. But not only that, there are some amazing scenes laden within this episode too, such as Jimmy's Chicago sunroof rant, along with him humming smoke on the water at the very end while driving off. It's an important event in regards to the show, and I think this episode was a bit overlooked, considering the massive, explosive season finales that this universe is known for. Still though, this is more of a light S tier than anything. It's not insane by any means, but as this show has taught us, you don't need insane events to make a solid, well-crafted episode. I mean, like, it still helps, but, like, you know what I mean. I cannot wait to see you all in Season 2. Take care.